Hi everybody, I am Kyle Cordes, as you can see here. I work at Oasis Digital, if you see here, and we teach Angular Bootcamp. So if you like what you see here in regards to Angular, uh, please follow me, please subscribe, please call us up and get some Angular training. Okay, the thing I am presenting today is this widget I'm about to show. Uh, this widget is a search select control that we've created after needing this functionality repeatedly. Uh, it is an Angular material-based search select control, and you'll note that as of uh, late January 2018, Angular material does not itself contain a search select control. Now, there's a, such a control may appear. In fact, there, there's some work being discussed that would add similar functionality to this, but I think what we've created here is, uh, is useful in spite of that, and more importantly, this can be used today and is being used today. Okay, so a search select control. That's simply a control where the user is picking from a list, but they can type things to help them search from that list. So that's a search select control. This varies from an autocomplete control. An autocomplete control means the user can type anything they want, but the computer is going to help them by finding things that are already in a list. And that's, that's a little different scenario. This is a search select, even though behind the scenes we're using an Angular Material autocomplete for some of the UI. Okay, so here is a simple search select control. Uh, there's just a few choices, they're hard-coded, you can pick one, right? This, there's really no reason to use a search select if you have five options. You could just use an ordinary selection control and it would work fine. But let's try this. This, uh, this uh, long, slow demo, this demonstrates a scenario where the list of entries from which to choose is both long, so there's many, many options, you know, possibly far more than you could load in your browser, and more importantly, it's slow. It, it's be, you know, pretend it's being loaded from some kind of server-side source, even though in this example it's not. It's just being you know, loaded by some server code. And we'll look at the code in a minute. Um, so you click here and this list came up. That time it came up quickly, but the next time it might come up slowly. Um, by the way, I can adjust fonts and so on and this thing will behave kind of in a way generally compliant with how, um, how material normally behaves, um, which means that some of the issues in material are, are also still present. Anyway, so I'll zoom just to show that it, you know, it kind of behaves in the normal way. Okay, so I could type some words here that are, uh, say, a, a subset of many of the choices. And there, now I just got a list of all the entries that mention the word sons, and I can choose one from the list. So there you go. Um, you'll note that that was slow. They did not appear right away. The reason they didn't appear right away is not because this control is slow. It's because this control is being provided a source of data which is slow or simulated to be slow. Uh, now in this next, next example, there is, there's a real API. So in this example, as I click here, the thing just made a call to a backend API. It got you know, some XML, HTTP requests, that sort of thing. And then the user can pick something. Um, and this, this is as good a place as any to demonstrate what really happens. This is intended to be a realistic sort of a way this is done in enterprise apps. So watch here. If I just like type a few words, type a few letters, you'll see that behind the scenes, the software was calling an API, passing it some search criteria, right? So this, this is, it's behaving in a way that makes it possible to do a server-side search for what the user types. Again, very important for the kind of applications where we use the search select because this list of options could be far longer than can ever be loaded into the user interface. Um, lastly, I'm going to show a multi-column example. I'm going to skip this cascading because it doesn't actually do anything yet. Let's look at a multi-column example. And this is also not yet in the box in Angular Material. Hopefully it will be, but... Uh, here I have used some CSS to sort of just coerce this, uh, this list to be organized like a table. And then down here, I've actually embedded an Angular material table inside. Now this demo works kind of badly on this, uh, this small screen size I've picked. Let me make it smaller and see if I can get a little more of a look. Boy, that's really a shame. I should do something different about that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, in fact, tell you what, we like doing things live. Why don't I just go in here to this uh, this example and just put in something that'll take up some space that'll let me scroll vertically. So style equals height. Let's see if that's enough to 
get me a taller page. Oh, <laughs> bummer. I'm actually looking at the one that's running uh that that's running on the uh up in you know up in the cloud somewhere, so to speak. Let me pause and get it running locally. Okay, I'm back. I just edited this thing to make the page longer so that when I get in here, uh I'm allowed to scroll. See, right, the page wasn't long, so I couldn't scroll, so I couldn't get my example up to the top, and so I couldn't get it to put the list downward. So that was just some uh, built-in Angular Material layout logic that was helping me prior to this edit. Okay, so what you recognize here, this is an Angular Material mat grid, or mat table, being used inside of a dropdown, and then uh, I can still do this kind of search thing here. So I type some search criteria, I get a shorter list, uh, I'm using behind the scenes and Angular Material autocomplete, but I'm actually implementing a search select and I'm presenting the list in a multi-column way using an Angular mat table. So that, that concludes the sort of whiz-bang demo. Um, if you're working on enterprise applications that need this kind of UI, that was probably really interesting. And if you're not, that was probably the most boring thing you have ever seen. You've probably left the video by now. Uh, let's take a look and see how this is used. Um, so here is our simple example. So in the simple one, which is right here, the HTML, let me see if I can get this right, simply used like so. You say, give me a search select. Uh, placeholder is, is how, you, how you label it. That's borrowed directly from Angular Material. Um, empty text is what should be shown if there are no matches, and we, we may see that in operation. This is an ordinary Angular form control here. And this data source idea, this is, this is how, as a programmer, I provide this search select a way to get its data. So again, the search select is, is able to call into application code when it needs a list. And so instead of pre-populating the search select with all the options, you know, totally infeasible in a, in a large-scale database, uh, instead, we give it a hook. So let's look at the simplest way to give it a hook. The simplest way to give it a hook is to simply make our demo component implement this data source interface, and then you provide two hooks. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip going into the full gory details of why these things do the way they do, or why they work the way they do. Um, the important thing, which we'll see in a little bit later example, is that there's, there's kind of a, a two-directional hook situation where when you're running the software, um, there's a, a mapping of the data back and forth between a data in the control and what you see. So like, for example, if I put a two here and press set, I get, oh, it's actually a defect in the code here. Um, uh, we'll see this better on the next one. In any event, the, the value that's inside the form control can be different than the form can, can, than the value that the user sees. Okay, so this long, slow one is fake, so we're gonna skip to one that's real. So here, here's the real one. We just saw this in operation here. I click here, I get some list that's being pulled from a server-side API. So let's look at how that one comes together. So in the same way here, we just put a search select on the screen and we give it a data source. This time I've made a variable which contains the data source. Let's see how that looks. Um, I've simply said it's of this type data source and that's a type that this library provides. Um, so a data source has to have two functions, two methods, a display value, which is how you take a, a database value or a database identifier and turn that into something for the screen. And then a search, which is how you take a, uh, like a partial match of something that the user has typed and you go find the database value for it. So this, this, this two, uh, two directional mapping back and forth between IDs and names. It happens all over in uh, many database-based enterprise apps, and so you see that pattern sitting in here. Okay, so to find the display value for something, we, we, I have some code here that just works out the string and number aspect. This is just sort of noise because of the way uh, in JavaScript, sometimes it hands you numbers and sometimes it hands you strings. But the important thing is we do an HTTP get we take an API URL and we append that string number onto the end, and then we go uh, get the data back, and then we convert it to the form required, which is right here, convert it from, to the form required by this library. And so here the display value is the first name, the last name, and an email. So when this is running, um, oh, I think I can maybe if I put like a value 32, I hit set. Behind the scenes, that just ran this code. That just ran this code so that, um, 
a, a, a val like an internal identifier in the system could be translated to something suitable for the user to see. Now, likewise, if I just type some, some letters here, that is running the search code, and it runs about the same way. So the search code is called with a search term. Um, oh, I have some printing so that if you open the console, you can see exactly what's going on. But again, this time I'm calling an HTTP GET. The, the particular API I'm using here is, uh, is served by the wonderful JSON server. And uh, JSON server can, can accept queries like this. Here, we'll see what that looks like. Here, let's get the, get the network tab up and then refresh it. Clear this stuff out. Oh, here, clear it out. Now, if I type ELLI, here we go. We ran some queries. And by the way, that debounce that you saw there, uh, you know, it, it canceled this because of debounce. That, that is, actually, it, it ran too many because of a low debounce, I should say. That is adjustable in the code. I just have it set to a low value so you can see things like the cancellations happen. Um, but here we go. So this is the query that was run against the backend API. And this is just the shape this API needs. That The details don't matter. Um, but what comes back needs to be converted into a list of these option entries, which can then be displayed by the uh, component code. Okay, so I think one more example. When you wanna do something fancier, like a, a multi-column dropdown, this gets a little bit harder. It's a little bit harder to use. Uh, that's because uh, in the world of, uh, of uh, I guess, Angular, Angular components, CSS, Angular material, and so on, uh, the ability to reach inside a component and restyle it is, is very limited. Um, in fact, I think this will turn out to be an area of innovation over the next few years because it's currently an area of, of great tedium and, and misery. Um, as a result, much of the time, if you want to use a component like this one to produce a, a very specific user experience, you actually need to write your own component. But the slick thing is when you write your own component, you don't need to work very hard. So let's take a look at how that works. Um, this demo5 multi-column, this uses a couple of, uh, in fact, here, while I'm in here, a live code during my demo, this extra div here was super, super useful to make it possible for me to always scroll, even when I'm working on a, uh, a small screen to kind of, to, to fight that, uh, convenient feature of Angular Material where it, where it forces the, the control to, you know, the, to go upward. Um, in fact, that's part of the Material spec. That's not even something Angular Material arguably even has any, anything to say about. Um, okay, so this multi-column component, uh, the, this demo, so here we go. This example one uses the obs select company CSS table. And that's the one I'm going to walk through because that's the simpler one because mat table is complicated. Um, so select company CSS table. This is an application level component. So if, if you haven't seen one of these repos like this before, everything you see in here is demo code. It's a demo application, except for this one directory. So the contents of this one directory are being published as the reusable code to NPM. And then all the other directories are all about making the demo work. So if, if you wanna study what code I, I've offered for reuse, it's literally only what's in this directory. Okay, so the select company CSS table, I named it in a way to illustrate, this is just an example of something you might do if you wanna reuse a base class, so I provided a base class. If you wanna reuse a base class to make your own visual experience, but with this search select capability. Um, you can do that without thinking about really, or, or certainly not without writing the couple hundred lines of code in the base class. Instead, you merely create something like this, so here is this select company CSS table. You'll note this, all this does is extend the base class. It doesn't even have any code in it. But because I've written a, you know, kind of a, a use case specific component here, it gives me a place to put a bunch of my own HTML and CSS. So I've done some HTML and CSS trickery here to uh, persuade some data that is in here is just some mat options and some spans to persuade that to look like a table to go into a, a columnar layout on the screen. So that was right here to go to this multi-column layout on the screen. All right, to get this multi-column layout. Uh, I've persuaded it to do that by simply telling it, oh, uh, a mat option is a table row group. Uh, this wrapper div is a table. Um, 
the span down inside, that'll be 14 points, and it's a table row. And then I think I even dropped something. Yeah, here we go. So the span itself, here the mat option span has a size. The mat option text is a, this is a div that gets created with a class applied by the angular material autocomplete machinery so in between this layer of dom and this layer of dom some other code creates a layer of dom some angular material code creates a layer of dom and i'm reaching in and saying treat that as a table row and then i'm saying treat my individual spans as table cells so basically there, there's a bunch of uh, css hijinks here that are used to persuade it that the particular dom structure which existed needs to be treated and looked at so that it behaves or formats like a table, an old-fashioned table for tabular data. Um, the important thing though, this, none of that's important. The important thing here is I could, I could get arbitrary control over the CSS and HTML, and I could have extended or modified the behavior, but I didn't have to. I could just use this kind of reusable, convenient base class um, to, to create a particular component need for a particular demo application. Okay, so I think that's probably a sufficient demo. Um, again, Here's the NPM package if you want to take a look. Uh, I just published it under this new name, so as I look at this, there's a, been a grand total of zero because no one else even knew this existed because it only existed 38 minutes ago. But this has been published under a previous package name and it, it seems to actually work. Um, it's, uh, everything you see here is on GitHub. If you find issues, certainly please open them. Uh, the demo is uh, from that previous GitHub page. You could get to the demo, no problem. Uh, this is me if you want to tweet at me and tell me how terrible this is. Uh, this is Oasis Digital where I work. This is Angular Bootcamp where I teach. And uh, this is the leftover tab. So thank you for watching. Bye-bye.